Hello, everyone. Today on the final bar, my guest is Willie Delwich from All Star Charts. He's going to share with us a big picture scenario looking at the overall market conditions. Really, another choppy day. We've had this sort of transitional digestion sort of period, indigestion perhaps period, as uh, as my friend Tony Dwyer recently called it. You know, it's a very choppy environment. You were sort of down earlier, uh, back up to the positive. S&P finishing flat, but a lot of leadership themes under the hood. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the final bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's edition of The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the markets. We focus on investor behavior, on decision making. We focus on fear and greed, all the emotional drivers of investment decisions. And we focus on them through the charts. Price should reflect sort of that aggregate to supply and demand, the aggregate emotional state of investors was fueling their buy and sell decisions. If you have one thing, I was told by my mentors to understand the trajectory of the markets, look at the chart. Everything else is uh, is other stuff. That's that's the stuff that will eventually validate or help you understand why the price evolved a certain way. Best thing we can do is focus on price. Uh, you know, this week, obviously a big earnings week, especially in the financial sector, Overall, I would say not a huge vote of confidence for the sector so far. You're seeing some distribution on some of the mega cap, uh, you know, larger banks and others that are uh, that are reporting. And overall, the S&P netting out to sort of a choppy environment today, more defensive of a day than we've seen in, uh, in quite a bit, a bit more of a, uh, of a risk off feel. We're going to get to all of those themes and more in our market recap and with my uh, with my guests today. Excited to talk to Willie Delwich here in, uh, in a few moments. Uh, tomorrow on Thursday, we have Chris Vermeulen from the Technical Traders joining us. Next week, three great guests lined up. On Tuesday, the 20th, Dale Pinkert joining us for the first time. I've been on Dale's show uh, with Forex Analytics a number of times. Excited to welcome him to this show. On Wednesday, the 21st, Ari Wald from Oppenheimer. On Thursday, the 22nd, Jonathan Krinsky from Baycrest Partners. Charting the second half is our special mid-year market outlook all week on Stock Charts TV. On this show on Monday, I provided my second half of the year market outlook. I'd encourage you to go check that out. We have some great uh, episodes all this week, uh, featured presentations. We have a panel discussion uh, tomorrow, hosted by Grayson Rose from Stock Charts. I just saw uh, Gina Martin-Adams from Bloomberg, her presentation come through the wire. So a lot of great content on there and make sure you check it out on our live stream, also on Stock Charts TV On Demand. Also, just as a reminder, I will be doing my free webcast next week on Tuesday, July 20th called The Market Top Checklist. I would argue, having reviewed a lot of historical market tops, there are a series of events that you can look for. And when those things, uh, when you check those boxes, more often than not, we are at the exhaustion point of an uptrend. I would not say we have all of them checked off today, but this is the list that I'm keeping in front of me. I'll share with you what those are and, and walk through some of the criteria and, uh, and where we're at at this moment. That's next Tuesday, July 20th, one o'clock Eastern. Go to marketmisbehavior.com slash market top to sign up for that free event. Let's continue on today with our market recap. So as I mentioned, sort of a continuing this digestion phase, this consolidation phase, even though the S&P seems to continue to make new highs. And this week, we've made another new all-time high. Overall, days like yesterday, day like today are really more uh, of a choppy uh, experience, right? There's really no huge directional movement. Uh, and, and if you look today from yesterday, we had a lot of volatility, but directionally did not depart too far from where we were on uh, on Tuesday's close. The S&P finishing up about 0.1%. The NASDAQ actually weighing a little lower if you look at the last that NASDAQ composite, but the NASDAQ 100 outperforming. And that is really, I think, the story of why the market is not pulling back further than it is now. It's because some of the mega cap tech names, things like uh, Apple and Alphabet and uh, and others that are able to keep the market uh, buoyed up pretty pretty well, even though a lot of individual stocks are are rolling over, and you can tell that from the breadth picture that overall has been deteriorating in a lot of ways. Um, things like the bullish percent indexes coming down below seventy percent are a good example of that. Also, mid caps, small caps, both down again today. So you have this continued pattern of 
large caps working, mid and small caps, not so much. And the small cap, small cap index, excuse me, down about 1.2% today. The VIX down to around 16.3. Very quickly, other asset classes, we had Powell's testimony uh, today. Things like inflation, apparently not a problem. We're, we're just going to ride that out okay. Uh, things, things are all right. Uh, according to uh, to the the summary, I've uh, I've sort of uh, I've sort of looked at from the testimony today, ten year yields down to around one thirty five. So we're nearing back down to those lows that we saw in the one twenties uh, not too long ago. And the TLT, which we usually use for bond prices, up about one point one percent. The dollar index, by the way, down about half a percent. Commodities overall uh, mixed, and gold and silver, the precious metals, up. Gold is often thought of as an inflation hedge. Interesting to see the GLD up 1%. We talked about overall that constructive pattern, potentially with the price of gold, and I think a day like today certainly indicating uh, you know, a potentially a safe haven as, uh, as stocks are a little less certain. Potentially, we ride that out to, uh, to hedge against further, uh, further inflationary pressures. Cryptocurrencies mixed today, plenty of volatility. Bitcoin was lower for much of the day, but actually finished up, uh, finished up uh, not too far from where it finished today uh, yesterday. Let's look at a chart of the S&P 500. We'll continue on talking about some of the key themes uh, in the uh, in the markets uh, today. By the way, a little later in today's show, we're going to do a segment called The Bottom Line, where we focus on earnings, heavy earnings week. We'll get to some of the banks uh, and some of the other uh, names that are reporting this week at Delta Airlines this morning uh, before the open uh, as well. So we won't get too much into the earnings picture, picture just yet. We'll get to that a little later. You know, looking at a chart of the S&P 500, again, I'm you know, drawing a trend line using the October low and using the March low that connects very, very well with lows in May, very well with lows in June, where we violated it one day and came right back to the trend line. We hit that again last week. And again, we remain above that uh, trend line support. So in this sort of environment, when a chart is going to new all-time highs, I'm often asked, well, what do you do next? And I would say there are two things you can do. Number one, you switch, you, you, you uh, use some sort of projection tool. You use a Fibonacci projection, Elliott Wave, GAN. These are all techniques and methodologies that are helping, designed to help you anticipate where a, a top might come, what, what level of resistance may come down the road. I tend to not use those as much. And, and that, that comes from a lot of the time that I spent on the institutional buy side where you know, uh, sort of, per, you know, a, a number that you might hit a price target really wasn't that helpful because uh, a money manager running a large book would would rarely want to sell something just because it hit a target. They would want to ride the trend. So option two is you switch into full on trend following mode, which is what I've encouraged, uh, you know, all of you to, to be thinking more about if you hadn't been uh, before now, which is basically recognizing the charts in an uptrend, recognize we continue to make a pattern of higher highs and higher lows. And the goal is to stick with that trend, to follow that trend until you see a sign of trend exhaustion, until you see a, a sign that the trend is no longer going up. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the chart of the S&P 500 on its own, arguably, you're not really seeing much of that. The only thing I may be able to pick out is the fact that we were recently overbought. We've came out, come out of that overbought region. That is rarely a great uh, signal on its own, I would argue, because a lot of times overbought just means it's up a lot. It means it's been in a good uptrend and overbought conditions can continue for, for quite a while. It doesn't necessarily on its own mean that, uh, that things are, are toppy. What I would be more concerned on is if you make a lower high, if you make a lower low, you start breaking support. You know, talking with a number of my guests recently, it's all about what would you need to see on the chart of the S&P to, you know, to reverse course. And I, and I think at this point, We've seen so far year to date, the S&P remain above its ascending 50-day moving average pretty much consistently the whole time. As long as that continues to hold on a pullback, this feels like we continue to chip away on, on further and further upside. At some point, I would assume that the 50-day moving average does not hold. And that's where I think you can start to uh, think a lot more defensively, a lot more cautiously. Now, you, we are seeing signals of uptrend exhaustion, potentially. Uh, you know, Next thing we'll look at here very quickly is looking at um, uh, some of the breadth indications. You know, one of the indications we've looked at uh, here are the cumulative advanced decline lines. This, you know, very subjectively color coded chart by me is is basically meant to illustrate the differentiation that you're seeing in some of the advanced decline data right now. So the S and P 500 obviously making new uh, closing highs. Uh, you know, essentially every month so far year to date. You can see the S and P's own advanced decline line here in green, continuing to make new highs every month, as uh, as expected. But if you look at the NYSE, 
uh, advanced decline line, if you look at the mid cap advanced decline line, if you look at the small cap advanced decline line, none of those are confirming this most recent high in the last couple of weeks. So while the S&P has made new highs, most of these other measures of breadth have not made new highs. Now that on its own suggests the uh, uptrend exhaustion, suggests, suggests that a lot of individual stocks are starting to rotate lower. And if you think about what is causing that divergence, it's the types of stocks that are in there, right? Think of things like the cyclical names, the industrials, the financials, especially energy that had been in uptrends that are no longer in uptrends. They're starting to really test support levels and have pulled back from making new all-time highs. That's what's going to cause the breadth data to, uh, to diverge. And, and I think the real question for investors, the strength that you're seeing in the growthy stuff, the FANG stocks and others, is that enough to continue to hold the market uh, higher? And what we've seen so far, the answer is Absolutely, there's enough upside uh, trajectory to continue to push, uh, continue to push stocks to the upside. My guest yesterday was talking to, to Larry Tentarelli. We talked about some of those big growth, growth names. Facebook was one of the stocks that uh, he and I talked about. And again, pulling back up a little bit today, but overall, you know, this is a, a huge benchmark name. Here's another one, uh, Apple. And obviously, these are a lot of the Fang names that we're looking at. You know, how negative can the market be when Apple has broken out of its Symmetrical triangle pattern has now made a new all-time high again this week. Extremely overbought, which means it's accelerating to the upside. I mean, that's not a negative pattern, and, and, and there's only so weak that the index could look. I mean, even if everything else is down, the market can't be down that much because stocks like this are are, are holding things up so uh, so well. And so I think that's the condition. How negative do you want to be with uh, with all the Fang stocks continuing to pound away to uh, to the upside? I think that's the question that a lot of us uh, would need to deal with. On the macro level, but what does not change are some of the weaknesses at the stock level. When we get to our segment a little later talking about earnings, we'll focus on some of the stocks that are reporting and some of the potential breakdowns of support. That's where I would be focused in terms of risk management. We need to take a quick break. We'll be back with my guest, Willie Delwich. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we break down market activity using the language of charting and technical analysis. As a reminder, we'll do another mailbag segment at the end of this week on Friday's show. We would love to hear from you. Any question is fair game. Questions about market dynamics, about particular technical indicators, tickers, or ratios that you're looking at, uh, ask us anything you like. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at finalbarsctv. We're on YouTube. Just put a comment below any of the video that you, videos that you're watching. We'd love to gather those questions. Hope to answer one of your questions on Friday's show. Also, as a reminder, go to stockchartstv.com. Use your email address, set up a free account. You can start watching all of our fantastic content from our great group of hosts, fantastic guests like Willie Delwich and others featured on our on-demand platform. Just go to stockchartstv.com. We're also on all the app stores. Just search for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Willie Delwich. Willie is the investment strategist at All Star Charts, coming to us from the upper Midwest. I've uh, had Willie on the show a number of times. He always brings charts that spur good discussion and spur good thinking. Willie, welcome back to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. I'm excited to be here. So we talked earlier in the market recap just about this uh, configuration of the market continuing to you know, be at or near all-time highs. But then, depending on where you look, the picture gets a little more rosy or a little less rosy, depending on what groups you're, you're looking at. Start us with this chart sort of uh, laying out your, your perspective. What are you seeing right now? Yeah, so so what we have here at the at the bottom is our our risk on risk off ratio. It's it's a risk on index we've created and a risk off index created. It's there's nothing complicated about it. It's you know the risk on is things like copper and high yield bonds and Australian dollar, um, a couple equity indexes. Risk off is you know things like bond, you know treasury bonds, the yen, gold, just basic stuff. But the, the question we're asking ourselves is, you know, kind of how is 2021 different from 2020? And I think the risk on risk off ratio describes that pretty well. 2020 was very much a risk on environment. 2021 has been much more sideways. And so, you know, we can look at individual indexes and say, are they going to break out? Are they going to resolve lower? 
when we aggregate it together, it's a, kind of a sideways, choppy, uncertain market. And, um, what I like about this presentation is that we, we add to it two indexes that aren't in the risk on risk off ratio, the emerging markets index, and then the relative uh, performance between broker dealers and the S&P 500. And you look at it over time and both of those two um, indexes kind of mimic what's going on from a risk off risk off risk on risk off perspective. And so if we're looking for resolution to this, this choppy environment, I think it pays to look at what emerging markets are doing. Are they breaking down? Or are they breaking out? So far, they're still moving sideways. And then also look at broker dealers relative to the S&P 500. Are they breaking down or breaking out? And there, the pattern is a little more uh, towards breaking down. And so um, we, we don't have, I think, enough evidence yet to say, yeah, this is going to resolve um, in favor of kind of a risk-off environment, but it, it's leaning that way. Um, and, and we're going to continue to watch and see um, you know, where the resolution is. But I, I think these are, these are the areas we're looking at to, to figure out, you know, kind of, can the index keep moving higher while breadth diverges? Does breadth get back in gear and, and start to join the indexes? Um, you know, lots of those questions that are being asked. I think this is a great setup to, to help answer those questions. It's such a great chart, uh, Willie, and, I, and it's, it, it can't help but notice how both of those, the ratio of brokers versus S&P, and then also EM making a lower high or lower peak mm -hmm. at, at a time when the, the indexes themselves, for the most part, making making a higher high. Chart number two is looking at what's called a breadth thrust. Can you describe what this is looking at and what it's telling you? Yeah, so so we, we talk a lot about breadth and, and look at it more kind of as as series over time. So think about, you know, you, you, you get the, the numbers quoted of the percentage of stocks trading above their 50 day averages or 20 day averages or the percent they're making new highs or new lows. This, this looks at it a slightly different way and says, okay, if we get extreme readings in some of those indicators, that, that's what we can call a breadth thrust. And so if we get 90% of a broad universe of stocks trading above their 50-day averages, that's a breadth thrust. If we get you know, slightly more than half of S&P 500 stocks making new 20-day highs, that's a breadth thrust. And why do those matter? Because once we get those, those signals of strength, that strength tends to persist for, for about a year or so after. Um, I'm just showing you know, like eight years on this chart, but but if you go back over the last decade, last two decades, last three decades, pretty much all of the net gains in the S&P 500 have been in these environments where we've, we've been within a year of the most recent breadth thrust. That matters now because the most recent breadth thrust based on these criteria were late May and early June of last year, meaning earlier, you know, about a month ago, we, we had that breadth thrust expire. And so we're, we're kind of, the, the market's kind of on its own right now. Um, again, a way that the market of 2021 is, is going to be, particularly the second half, is going to be different than, than the market we saw over the past year. And so um, I think it pays, pays to, to be aware of that, know kind of beneath the surface conditions, you know, how are they the same? How are they different? Right now, we're a market that is making new highs, but isn't getting the support of, of these breadth thrusts that, that we had in place for, for most of last year. It's such a great chart, Willie. Really. It reminds me a lot in the Fidelity chart room. We had a chart very similar to this, which is one of my favorites. Really looking at when you know people were piling into a particular, you know, when when a lot of stocks were sort of on on one side, especially pushing higher, and mm -hmm. what that meant. You know, just we we only have about thirty seconds left, but I'd love to ask you. You know, given the fact that the market's sort of on its own, as you described, given the pullback that we've seen in things like broker dealers, other financials. And the strength that we've seen in some of the growth areas of the market here in the seasonally weakest part of the year, when things tend to struggle, how would you be thinking about playing the next month or two as an investor? Do you stick with the growthy stuff, the mega cap stuff that's been working, or do you look for opportunities in things like financials and energy, which have been in a bit of pullback mode here? Yeah, I there's a I'm, I'm going to answer this by not answering it. I'll, I'll say longer term, I think energy and financials are are probably where you want to look. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but this be, being a seasonally weaker period, this being the summer, um, you know, rather than thinking about going long or going short, I think maybe for investors, maybe going fishing is, is the best option in this environment. Just kind of move to the sidelines a little a bit and let things settle out. 
Not to Jesse Livermore in your comment there, right there, which I very much appreciate, Willie. Listen, thank you so much for coming on as always. You do such a great job of, of breaking things down in a way that I think many can understand. I appreciate you coming on. Stay safe, be well. We'll talk to you again soon. All right, thanks a lot, Dave. Have a good one. That's Willie Delwich. Willie is the investment strategist at All Star Charts. And you know that chart looking at breadth thrust is interesting. And I've seen a lot of uh, discussion about uh, the strength of uh, of the market and especially that initial move. You look at, you know, think about when that first 90% signal came. It was just a couple of months after the March 2020 low. And that was a real indication that it was in fact a V bottom that, you know, things had really recovered quickly. And you look at what's happened in the 12 months since that initial signal, it's been a fantastic overall rise. Um, very interesting that he's seeing us in sort of a, a, a no man's land, or as, as he described it, the markets are sort of on their own right now. And I think when you look at the breadth data now, you look at sort of the rotational environment we've been uh, we've been in, uh, certainly makes uh, makes sense relative to some of the charts that he was showing there. Our next segment is called the bottom line. What we love to do is focus on earnings. Uh, this is sort of the beginning of earnings season. We're starting to uh, accelerate. So really every week we'll have a new group of uh, of, uh, of companies to follow and, and themes to look at. You know, as always, you have to remember that earnings don't happen in a vacuum. So on a week like this, you also have inflation numbers coming out. You have Fed testimony, uh, you know, all sorts of things coming out. Uh, and, uh, and so earnings are one piece of the puzzle, but an important one. And, you know, what I was taught, uh, again, spending a lot of time with, uh, with money managers, uh, the goal was to follow earnings, right? To identify earnings and, and what companies would be able to grow earnings. And the argument is price follows earnings. So earnings releases can be very, very informative for the short term uh, in terms of the short term reaction, you know, leading up into earnings and then coming out of an earnings release, but also over time and seeing the companies that are able to, you know, grow earnings consistently and where the opportunities may be. Let's start with uh, a lot of the financial stocks. You know, we think about earnings this week. It's really been dominated by the financial. Started yesterday with J.P. Morgan and Goldman before the open. And, you know, again, you know, the goal here is not to comment too much on the actual earnings release. You can research that on your own and make your own assessment. My goal is to think about the technical perspective around those uh, those moments. And, you know, what I'm looking at the chart of JP Morgan, what I can't help but notice is we, you know, the last, uh, the move in May into June was really the acceleration to um, to the uh, to the upside. That was really the end of this leadership uh, run so far for the financial sector. From early June on, it's been a very different environment where a lot of the banks have been in pullback mode. They've been testing support levels. They've been coming off of it. Uh, and the question is, are we getting a tradable bounce off of support or is this a the next bounce before the next leg higher? And, and I would argue on a chart like JP Morgan, it's all about uh, the, the neckline. This has the potential to turn very quickly into a head and shoulders top. And a head and shoulders top is a classic Pad price pattern where basically you have an uptrend, which is important to remember that happens in an uptrend phase. You have the market going higher. You have a high surrounded by two lower highs, right? So you have a peak, the peak to the left, the peak to the right are a little uh, lower than that than the head. So it sort of again looks like the head and the two shoulders. And from there, the, the real signal is when you break down through what's called the neckline. So if you take a trend line connecting the low from April, the low from June, uh, you would need to break that. So just visually pretty easy to put together. You literally just connect um, the lows and that's sort of the trend line that you would keep in mind. That's what we would call the, uh, the neckline. The concept being, as long as we remain above that neckline, the trend overall is still okay because you're not making a lower low. When you break it down through that, all of a sudden we've completed a Dow theory transition from uptrend to downtrend. We've made a lower peak and then we would have made a lower low and all of a sudden this is now in a new downtrend phase. So breaking below that neckline and really 145 would be the ultimate line in the sand, I would say. That's the low from April. That would really confirm a negative transition. So what you did not get so far from a stock like JP Morgan or uh, Goldman, which we'll look at uh, next, ticker GS, is uh, any sort of real appreciation, even given earnings that were not that uh, not that negative. It wasn't like a, uh, wasn't a, a, a huge uh, uh, um, you know, change, I would say, in trajectory, but overall, the, the, the stocks have not really appreciated uh, uh, around there. Goldman is arguably one of the better charts, uh, looking at some of the larger financial institutions, as I was mentioning with uh, Larry Tensorelli yesterday, something like an American Express or Moody's or other stocks within the sector that are, are in much stronger, consistent uptrends. But within sort of this mega cap, uh, you know, uh, banks, uh, regional banks, and, and so forth, Goldman's arguably one of the better ones because it's not really uh, testing support at this point. It's really more at the upper end of the range. 
the question for something like Goldman, is there enough to, you know, to push above uh, the previous highs? Can it get above 390, which would indicate uh, potential upside uh, uh, follow through? Elsewhere, very quickly, I'm just going to hit on some of the stocks that are reporting uh, this week that have reported they are coming up. Pepsi reported uh, yesterday before the open as well, and a nice uh, earnings quarter, a nice win, a nice surprise to the upside, and within a sector, consumer staples, which is arguably fairly negative, which the average stock is in a, is in a pretty decent uh, downtrend. If you look at things like Kraft Heinz or others, fairly destructive charts. There's a small number of, uh, of stocks that are breaking out of bases, that are in uptrends. Pepsi is one of those that I would uh, I would highlight. Look at the base going back from the February 2020 high that lines up very well with the high at the end of last year. Lines up pretty well with the peak that we've had in recent months. And look how we finally broken out of a multi-year base um, for the stock. So overall, a nice constructive pattern, a nice breakout. And a lot of times, earnings can provide that catalyst to push the demand and the supply picture into a different range, right? You know, the question is, can there be enough momentum to push? The stock above previous highs, something like a nice uh, quarter uh, from earnings can uh, can definitely do that. So nice uh, upward uh, upward move there. Um, let's see where else can we look. You know, airlines overall, some of the more negative charts that I would see around here. Delta just reported before the open uh, today, and you know the problem I have with a lot of up airlines is just they're not going higher, which sounds oversimplifying, and it absolutely is. I, I don't think you need to make this terribly complicated to recognize. Uh, a group that has gone from an uptrend phase to a downtrend phase at a time when Facebook is at all time highs, when some of the other stocks that we mentioned are breaking out of, uh, of uh, bases, Amazon breaking above uh, resistance, Apple breaking to new highs. You have a chart like this, which is actually making new swing lows. Delta uh, today uh, breaking below or closing below its 200 day moving average yesterday, following through to the downside today. I think at this point, you're looking at the low from Late uh, late January, early February, around thirty seven fifty. But overall, I think the path of least resistance on a chart like this is down, and the relative strength really starting to uh, to deteriorate. There are other stocks reporting uh, through the remainder of this week. I'd highlight um, uh, Alcoa on Thursday, uh, also United Healthcare, Morgan Stanley before the open on Thursday, and then Friday morning, Schwab and State Street are two to watch in the financial sector. And overall, again, so far, not impressed by the themes that we're seeing out of the financial sector. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go, chart number one. We talked about breadth, and I, I thought Willie Delwich did a great job of breaking down the breadth uh, uh, conditions, particularly breadth thrust and the long-term signal you get from some of those uh, some of those extremes in uh, in uh, in breadth. You know, one of the things I would be concerned on right now is the fact that only 50% of the S&P members are above their 50-day moving average. So while the S&P is making new all-time highs, the Nasdaq is making new all-time highs, you have a lot of stocks in decent uptrends. Only 50% of the S&P are above their 50-day uh, moving average right now. So that tells you that all is not well. Even though the indexes are holding up, there are a lot of groups that are breaking down. And for me, that speaks to internal weakness. That tells me to think more on the side of risk management as opposed to re potential reward. Chart number two is looking at the financial sector. We talked in our segment, the bottom line, about the reports coming out of uh, financials uh, for earnings this week. And a lot of them uh, have done so far. The rest will come through the remainder of this week. You know, looking at the chart of the XLF at the top, making a lower peak, uh, just breaking below its 50-day moving average, over the last month, this is the relative strength of the financial sector rolling over in the last six weeks. This is the chart of the 10-year yield. So if you want to know whether or not the financial sector is outperforming, a chart of the 10-year is a fairly uh, good proxy for the relative strength of financials. Interest rates have been in a downtrend, right? And then rates coming off again uh, today overall in a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a cyclical downtrend. And you can see that the weight that that places on the financial sector, the bullish percent index for the financial sector around 55%, which means 45% of the sector members are already in point and figure downtrends. Finally, the airlines index is the Dow airlines index that we track. But if you look at the jets ETF, Delta airlines, many others, a lot of those stocks are at their 200 day moving averages, potentially breaking down through that key smoothing mechanism. But most of them, if not all of them have already broken down through price support. I would be concerned about further downside in those names. Folks, that is our show for today. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. Special thank you to Willie Delwich joining us from the Milwaukee area, sharing his thoughts on the overall environment. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe, have a good night. Hey guys, Dave Keller here with StockCharts.com. Thanks so much for watching our video. If you enjoyed it, and we hope you did, 
hit the like button right below. Also, we have so much new content every day. Consider subscribing to the channel. Just hit the subscribe button in the video or right below. Thanks for watching. Stay safe. Have a fantastic day.